Rachel, thank you so much. I am so excited to chat with everybody today and share some little tidbits of my story that I think a lot of people have either not heard about or maybe they don't know about me. Um, just to kick things off, I, I've done gymnastics for 15 years professionally and being able to be a gymnast on the 2016 Olympic team, that was something that was so surreal, but um, I was 16 at the time, freshly turned, and so I think ignorance is bliss, really. That phrase played a big role in that because it's just teenage me walking into the arena and going, well, I guess it's just another meet. And, you know, the Olympic rings are <laughs> hanging around. So that's that's quite the kicker. But there's some things outside of that that I think a lot of people would, you know, I, I, think every, I think all of you would like to hear about it. So one of my favorites is that my mom is a social worker and a therapist. My sister is a, is a therapist and, and has her own private practice. I see a therapist. And so mental health has really been something that's played a huge role in my life. And something that a lot of people don't know is that before I'm competing at any competitions, I do get really frazzled. And sometimes I would cry. I would get really bad stomach aches. I would have panic attacks and have to kind of like pace around in the corner and visualize over and over again out of like a nervous habit not out of like oh you know i'm gonna go through my routine because it makes me feel secure I'm like i have to go through my routine otherwise it's bad luck <laughs> so i'm a really fun teammate to be around i i am i swear especially now but when i was a kid it was a lot and so there was a lot of like me crying and getting nervous but over time i think being um in that pressure firsthand, I learned how to cope with it a little bit better. So it turned into belly breathing. It turned into taking a deep breath and blowing out the candle that is your finger. Um, it turned into putting my hand on my stomach and looking down. And when you take a deep breath, you kind of watch it expand and watch it go in and watch it expand. And by doing that, it just takes your mind off of the stress that you're in. We're going to talk about moments before I learned any of those techniques where I would sob and cry. One of my favorites is that uh, not gymnastics related. I went to take my driver's test. Oh my gosh, wait, no, hold on. This was after the Olympics. So this is still happening. It's okay, we're human, guys. Um, in 2017, 2018, I think it was somewhere in there, I went to take my driver's test. This is post-Olympic Games, okay? And may I just add, I finally learned these techniques at the Olympics. Went in, hit a good routine, got gold as a team, got silver individually for balance beam. I walk into this driver's test and I sit down and immediately just start crying um, because I have, spoiler alert, I have really bad test anxiety. <laughs> and a lot of times as someone who is homeschooled, this was something that would really stress me out if I had to take a math test or a history test or whatever. It would usually result in me crying and forgetting all the answers and having to take a five minute break because <laughs> before we even started because I was just really frazzled. But, you know, over time, again, you learn to breathe. So the driver's test. Sat down, immediately started crying, and then started picking answers that would, you know, if you get 10 wrong after 10, you're kind of, you're done for. So I would purposely get 10 wrong and would just select answers so that way I could get out of the DMV as quick as possible and then got into the car and cried. And I remember my mom being like, it's okay. Everybody fails their first driver's test. It's fine. And I'm like, yeah, sure, okay, whatever, you know? So I go back a second time. And the second time around, I sit down and now I've kind of like Pavlov dog myself into thinking that when I sit at the DMV, I now cry. So I start getting really nervous and start like getting really sweaty. My heart's beating really fast. I can hear it in my ears and um, I'm trying not to cry so hard. I'm like, just think about your answers. I need you all to know. I know the answers. <laughs> I know them. And what was happening was every time I would get nervous, my brain would do this thing called flooding, where I am so nervous, I completely forget anything that I've studied for. What I didn't know was how to fix that and that it would actually be using the same tools that I'd be using in gymnastics. So what's really puzzling to me is that I could be on a world stage and compete and use my body in all these crazy ways, but you sit me down and ask who has to make the left turn first at an intersection, sob, tears, okay? And so... <laughs> I remember getting into the car and crying and being like, I'm never gonna pass, something's wrong with me. And my mom was like, you're just anxious. <laughs> and um, it was a lot, it, it was really frustrating, you know, those two times. And my mom was like, don't worry, I didn't pass until my third time too, third time's the charm. And so I get in there and I go into the DMV and those first two times were in New Jersey, this third time is now in California. And I sit down and I'm like, okay, Let's, let's think about this. The first two times, 
I sat down and I cried and that's okay because I was having a lot of big feelings but those big feelings got in the way of me being able to pass my driver's test so logically what's going to happen here I studied extra so that way I could make sure that if a question came up I had the familiar language in my brain which I know is the whole point of studying but I did just I kept studying thinking that that was going to fix everything and yeah it was really helpful but it was my nerves that were getting in the way so going back into gymnastics you know and being like okay we're competing we're doing mental gymnastics right now and sitting in this DMV and putting my hand on my stomach and taking a deep breath or putting my hand on my chest and kind of feeling the pressure like skin on skin from my hand that always feels really good and just taking my time taking my time reminding myself that I'm not being rushed that nobody's watching me and that if it gets wrong again that we just try again next time but everything's gonna be okay it's all gonna work out and sure enough Spoiler alert, I passed this one and now I drive around left and right. So (laughs) I think a lot of people really get a kick out of, you know, an Olympian crying over taking a driving test, a written driving test, just because at the end of the day, the things that stress us out is different for everybody and learning to cope with those things. It's not that next time I go take a test, I'm getting ready to go to college. Next time I go take a test, I'm going to have to take a test. I'm not going to be able to sit and say, well, I'm going to (laughs) leave or purposely fail the test so I can leave. (laughs) I'm not going to be able to do that. But what I can do is know that, you know what? I am going to be anxious for the next test. So let's pre-prep for that. What are things that we can do? Sometimes chewing something like gum, if you're allowed, uh, that helps just stay stimulated. Learning how to breathe, which breathing exercises work the best. Um, drinking water when you feel like you're at a stump, going to another question and coming back to the one that you were struggling with. Sometimes you just have to cope with those things and they get easier as time goes on. And as someone who's been competing for 15 years, I can tell you right now, it does get easier. You don't get less nervous. You learn how your body gets nervous and how your brain gets nervous and you work around that. Everybody is unique. Everybody's different. And if somebody says, well, just don't be nervous, it's not very helpful. But what I can tell you take lots of deep breaths, reset your brain, and that everything's going to be fine. So that's kind of my first little story. I think my next one would probably be that I trained in a location for 11 years. I was in an environment where I started at five and ended at 16. And um, it was interesting. I was with the same coach from that point the whole the entire time. And what's tough about that is that this coach um, and well, me as well as a handful of others ended up filing her under emotional and verbal abuse um, because the training was just not a good environment. There was a lot of yelling going on and, and there was just a lot happening that, you know, to this day, there are some things that you're looking back on and therapy, it's like, oh, wow, that came up. I didn't realize that was a problem, <laughs> um, which happens, you know, it, it, it still stings, but something was done about it and uh, there was, you know, There's a suspension that happened and it's making sure that we're making, we're making sure that our kids are going to be safe, especially practicing in gymnastics. And so two years after 2016, I had taken a break. I hadn't done any gymnastics and I realized that I missed it. And it turns out that I didn't hate the sport. I just hated the environment that I was in. I love flipping. I love being upside down. I love competing. I love being able to perform at the best of my abilities, but it was the environment that was making me feel like I hated everything around me. And so I was like, well, maybe if I change the environment, then things will feel a little more well-rounded for me. And so that's what I did. I moved to California, farthest place you could go from New Jersey. (laughs) Um, But I moved to California and I went to this new gym. And what was interesting about that was this coach was completely different than any coach that I had ever seen. She was very reserved, knew what she wanted of me. She was always like, okay, you tell me what you want and where you want to go. If you want to go to the Olympics, I will help you get there. If you want to go to a training camp, I will help you get there. If you want just to get these new skills or this certain routine, I will help you get there. But you have to tell me and you are leading. I'm not leading. I am just your guide. I am someone who gives you support. I am someone who tells you how to do things when you ask. Until then, I stand to the side and let you know that you have my support. And I was like, well, this is new. It's weird. (laughs) Never seen that before. And I remember the first couple days of kind of practicing there, feeling really anxious. And it was building. And I realized that I was waiting for this coach to yell at me. She was going to, I was like, well, she has to blow at some point, you know, she's got to, everybody gets upset. (laughs) 
And after like day three or four, I ended up going to the bathroom and having this huge panic attack because I thought this impending doom was coming, you know, this big blow up was going to happen and it never came, which was almost worse because that's what I was used to. And it's like, well, maybe if the big blow happens, then it happened and I know it's going to happen and everything's going to be okay. But, you know, trauma really responds to patterns and to, um, to routine, to habit and habit for me, unfortunately, was getting yelled at a lot. And so we had to do a lot of resetting and a lot of, okay, let's take a step back. Is she upset? Or am I just thinking that she's upset? Should I ask? <laughs> the answer is yes. Or, you know, if anything, it's like, she's not upset. She's actually really passionate right now. And, and you know, it may be the same mannerisms. There was a lot of that going on. Needless to say, it was so interesting of going and competing at 18, 19, 20, 21 years old versus competing as a 16 year old simply because of the environment that I was in. At 16 years old, it was, I'm not nervous, I'm fine. Look at me, look how strong I am. I don't want you to perceive me as weak. I don't want you to perceive me as anxious. Not that those two things go hand in hand, but that was what I was taught. And so it was like, I don't want you to see me as any of those things. I am stronger than that. I am not nervous. And I'm not nervous because I put in the work and I put in the work because I don't want to be nervous and I don't want to get yelled at. And so it went from that to being 20 and my coach saying, you know, my new coach saying, well, yeah, you're going to be nervous. Of course you're going to be nervous. Everybody, who, why wouldn't you be nervous? You haven't competed in four and a half years. Of course you're going to be anxious. This makes so much sense. Take your time. You've practiced this so well. I believe in you. And she would say those things right before I compete. And, you know, it went from, I'm not nervous at all to, yeah, I'm terrified right now. And that makes sense. <laughs> I should be nervous. <laughs> and being able to acknowledge that I was nervous made me less anxious for the routine that was coming because sometimes your feelings just need a little bit of acknowledgement and they get bigger and bigger until you look at them and say hi i see you and then go oh okay bye <laughs> that doesn't happen all the time but the competitions or the training camps that i was in it was i am so anxious right now because i know that people are looking at me as the 16 year old even though i'm 21 and that my body's changed and that i have changed and my gymnastics looks different that makes sense so let's go do what we practice for. <laughs> and that's that's kind of the difference of like good coaching slash good mentoring versus bad coaching, bad and bad mentoring. The way that we talk to our kids and the way that we talk to our students is everything. It is everything. And so I encourage you all, you or if you're a teacher, if you're a student, whatever it is, to be, you know, your favorite self because sometimes your best self can look like pressure and um, I, I guess these expectations of other people, you know, whether that be your parents, teachers, friends, whatever it is, what does your best self look like? Does, your best self may be that you study a little more than you do now or that you give yourself more breaks that you, than you do now. Your best self may look like, okay, I am going to get anxious before a test, but how am I going to work with that rather than pretending it doesn't exist at all? Or your best self may be you see somebody struggling and your your best self says, you know, or your favorite self, your favorite self, your favorite self says, I want to show up for other people. I want to show up for myself. Your best self may say, okay, well, I need to be perfect for everyone around me and I cannot be anxious. I cannot be perfect. I have to be able to pass the expectations and the pressures of other people. I have to be able to meet what everybody wants me to do. Your favorite self says, okay, what is it that I want? How do I want to handle things? How can I help other people? How can I you know, acknowledge my emotions and work around those things. So look into that, maybe make a little list. What does your best self look like versus what does your favorite self look like? And see if there's a difference. Because if there's not, that's that's fun, you know? <laughs> but for me, there's, there's a very big difference between the two, there still is. So um, yeah, thank you so much for listening to me chatter on and about and kind of share all these things that I feel like a lot of people may not know. I, I feel like it may be really helpful. These are all things that I wish somebody had told me growing up um, that everybody, and it's not to invalidate, but everybody gets anxious. Everybody gets scared. Everybody gets really sad. It's just how we work with those things and how we can show up for ourselves and for other people. So hang in there. You got this. You're doing great. Good luck. <laughs>